all Delulu besties welcome. This is a safe space to vent, talk shit, reflect, and most importantly, keep it real. It's better to trauma dump here so that we don't explode on innocent randos. Just Just admit admit it, you're you're bothered. bothered. What's up, Delulu besties? Welcome back to another episode of Balancing the Bullshit. Yo. Hi. (laughs) So we have some fun updates for you guys since the last time we talked. Number one, I'm a Bravo celebrity now, apparently. You are listening to famous people. Yeah, essentially. Yeah, and if anyone doesn't know what a Bravo celebrity is, it's a Bravo TV show cast member. And I was on... (laughs) I was on an episode of The Real Housewives of Potomac this past week, the episode that came out this past Sunday. Me and a friend had heard, this was back in May, actually, May of last year, we had heard that The Real Housewives of Potomac were in town and that they were going to be filming at a drag show. So they rushed over. Yeah, basically. (laughs) You look so cute on the TV. Thank you. I'm (laughs) glad because I didn't feel it. I was so tired. It was like a Wednesday. I had a long day and he texted me. He's like, hey, they're going. Are you coming? And I was like, no, there's no way. But then he talked me into it. It's like, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to (laughs) to be be on TV. (laughs) So I hobbled out of my apartment and we went, we showed up. We didn't actually know if it was going to work out that they were going to show up like we had heard. But we got there, and there were, like, 20 cameras in there. Oh 20 different cameramen with, like, the big-ass cameras. Do they bring lights, ring lights, or how um, is they it? They had, you know those people that hold up, like, the things? Oh, like the yeah, poles? like the lighting. Yeah. Yeah, so they had that. Um, Damn, so they just have to stand right by the camera person the entire time. Yeah, That's the whole job. Yeah, and there was, there was a ton of them, and they were just filming, like, random stuff around the bar. You know, like, the scenes they show in between. When they're talking, like they would, they were filming like a guy pouring a drink oh, and cool. just people talking. It was really cool. I had never seen anything yeah, I like would this love to see that. It was so cool. And then, yeah, the housewives showed up. Uh, it was a pretty full bar because the word had gotten out that they were going to be there. And when it's crazy they showed how the up, work got out so fast. I know. It's not like we're in college anymore. We're such a tight knit community. Right. Like, yeah. But again, in the gay community, every it's pretty small. And true. so like, the bar knew it was coming and they told uh, their friends and that just got out that way. That's how I'm assuming it got out. Like we had heard from a friend who knows someone who works at a bar at that bar, mm. I think. So we showed up, the housewife showed up. There actually had a table set up for them literally right in front of me. And so yeah, it was like a foot. Yeah, Danny was like literally right there, right next to them the whole time. The whole time. It was was so so cool. cool. And if anyone watches the show, I got a picture with Candace. Wait, that's why you look pretty if they're walking around with such good lighting. Oh, yeah. The lighting was great. The camera quality was good. So it was awesome. It was fun. What a dream to be on Bravo. I know. It was so cool. And I know Laura, our life coach, totally is oh, judging us right now. Yeah, she thinks we kill our brain cells. Which we are. Let's be honest. Like, reality <laughs> TV is ridiculous. I can't help it. I can't help it either. And I know... The funny thing is, I know it's something I should cut out because I can feel... I don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I can feel myself... I can feel it affecting my mood when I watch Housewives sometimes. Like, especially oh, yeah. if it's like... So I watched The Real Housewives of New Jersey last year and that one especially like i was always cranky because they're so yeah, mean, they're and, mean. Nasty. and like but especially so many times i just laugh because they're so funny it is funny like and their it's mean just, drama is just funny it's funny and it's just an escape and mm-hmm. i wish i didn't like it but i do <laughs> it is what it is it is what it is i'm just accepting it yeah. eventually this is a habit that i want to cut out of my life but i'm just not there yet like, oh, I not need me i'm escape. embracing the trash you're gonna watch forever Fuck yeah. <laughs> okay, maybe I, I mean, until too. I get bored of it. But right. yeah. <laughs> it's like the other day when David was like, I don't like you wearing thong underwear. I was like, well, you got to embrace the trash. It is yeah. what it is. That was so funny. And every like five seconds, you're like, David thinks this is trashy. <laughs> <laughs> and you were just putting words in his mouth. Yeah. 
<laughs> he was like, I never called you that. <laughs> <laughs> He's just conservative. <laughs> Ugh. <laughs> so what? now we're both famous. Yes. This is going to be your, your forever, uh, what's it called? Five no. minutes of fame? Yeah. That? This is going to be your forever <laughs> yeah. that. Because, it's like 30 seconds of fame. Yeah, honestly. 30 seconds yeah. of fame, literally. And that's how I, like, I still am so proud of my Diplo story. Oh my God, I love this story. Tell it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's literally nothing. It's also 30 seconds, but like, I'm just so proud. Not even 30 seconds, but like two. <laughs> literally. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so one of my girlfriends used to work in the bar industry right out of college. She didn't want to get a real adult job, and good for her because it's a scam anyway. Right. But she flew out straight to Vegas and mm-hmm. became a bottle service Oof. girl. Mm-hmm. And I mean, think about how expensive it is to do bottle service in Vegas. Yeah, I'm like, sure she made so much money. So much. And she met the richest people, celebrities. So we went out there for her birthday a few years ago. And, oh my God, it was amazing. I felt like I was rich and famous. Our entire day was scheduled back to back by promoters. They just sat us at all these expensive, fancy dinners in back rooms. Really nice, like five-star dinners. And they put us on stage with... Kygo with all these shows every night and one night Diplo was playing and they just sat us backstage with I don't know these random guys that were picking up the bill I have no idea who they were they they just I just sat where they told me to sit literally the entire weekend and then at one point they're like okay girls get up come on so I was like okay whatever (laughs) I could have literally been taken wherever but luckily it turned out to be the coolest thing I didn't even know this I sound like such a peasant but I did not know I don't know if this is only Vegas hotels or if this is all hotels. I didn't know they have secret wings. Obviously, you walk into a hotel. It's what everybody sees Mm. a normal hotel. But then, I don't know, we just kept walking. And all of a sudden, it went from marble floor to literally gold. Everything was gold. I felt like I was like in some royal king's world. I was like, where am I? The elevator, it was all gold. And it went up to the uh, residences. Because like, I guess when artists get booked in Vegas and they have to be there for so many shows, then they give them a residence there. So it was like a little townhome in this hotel. It was so nice. And I guess it was Diplo's place. Obviously, I know who Diplo is. I like his music, but I didn't know what he looked like. All I know is there were all these Houston basketball players there, and they were all hitting on me. One guy stormed off because I don't remember his name, but I was like, hi, I'm Karen. And... And he, he expected you to know who he was, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's and I was, so funny. I thought he was being rude. I was like, hello, he what's your rude. name? Yeah. And he was like, seriously, you don't know my name? And I was like, why are you being so weird and rude? And then he stormed off. And then my girlfriends were like, Karen, that's, I literally can't even remember who it was now. But they were like, that's so-and-so. And I was like, huh? Who is <laughs> that? Is like, so you. <laughs> I'm not into sports. I don't right. give a shit. You're a normal human being. You're not above anybody. Exactly. I'm, I love that you did that. <laughs> Same. <laughs> he probably still thinks about that to this day. <laughs> like he just keeps him up at night. <laughs> I'm just putting out here all these celebrities in check. <laughs> Diplo too because okay so then at one point this like greasy for I hope he never listens to this not that he ever would he just looked greasy and wrinkly and I was like no. who is this white trash man he just straight up was like oh do you want to go into one of the bedrooms he didn't explicitly say it like that but that's pretty much what he said and I was like who the fuck are you and then again same thing he ended up walking away because I was like fuck off pretty much and my girlfriends were like oh my god that's Diplo and I was like oh, <laughs> no wait, way wait come back <laughs> I'm just kidding no in the moment I was like ew I don't give a fuck I don't care who you are but you just can't I mean obviously people act like that but I I don't entertain that yeah we don't fuck with people like that no I've also heard Diplo is kind of a douchebag I've heard bad things about him his reputation I forgot the whole point of the story when we were walking up this random ass guy I guess it was like security when he was like girls come up he was like okay we're not gonna make y'all sign NDAs tonight but don't pull your phones out because there's gonna be security up there and if you pull your phone out then we're gonna have to escort y'all out So, I was like, damn, Diplo just hit on me. I rejected him. I'm partying in his home. No one's ever going to believe this. And then the next morning, I wake up to my Instagram blown up. 
all these people, like friends, my brother, everybody was sending me his story because I was in it. And they were like, is this you? I'm so confused. And I was yes. like, oh my God, now I can tell this story and people will believe me. There's video proof. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the video, it was so funny. The video was so funny because I remember there was a penthouse full of attractive girls who you could tell were all either self-conscious or just being very thirsty. <laughs> And you were just sitting on the couch, like, like in my own world. You had your hand up in the air, like doing like a little dance. Do you remember? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I was living like, my best life, yeah. so unaware of where I was. I'm like everyone <laughs> else. You could tell everyone else in the room was thinking about what's going on or what yeah, they're going like, to do next. Trying so hard to like behave or like, yeah, literally, what am I going to do next? And I was that like, is no, funny. No, no. <laughs> that is funny. I wonder what Diplo wanted people to come into the room for. Do you think they were going to do drugs or something? Either that or hook up. I mean, what else? That's weird. You're kind of gross. I know. That's so gross. I bet he gets girls so all the time like that just because they know that's him. Oh, definitely. And they're like, yeah, I'll go in the bedroom. Yeah. No. Yeah. He's definitely like a playboy type. Is that what you call him? Like a... Oh, yeah. But you know what's weird? So I didn't even follow him on Instagram. And... When people sent me his story, then I was looking through it all, and it was so weird. Obviously, he's in Vegas, so it's like all these party stories of him, like, doing his set and all these hot girls or whatever. And then the next morning, literally after his party, which people were there until... We left at 7 a.m. That's And there were so many people still there. And then you click on the next story. It's him with his baby. Oh. Yeah, literally. I was like, oh. I didn't know he had a baby. Me either. And how do you go to your baby after that? No sleep? I, 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 no words. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Well, I do love that story. And I feel like neither of us would be caught in dead in Vegas again. Oh, God, no. Uh-uh. That's like one of my least favorite cities, actually. Not on stage. If somebody took me on stage now, I would probably throw a fit. I'd be like, get me the fuck off. I yeah. want to go to go home, sit on my couch and watch Real Housewives and exactly. cuddle with my Yeah, dog. Vegas is just so not my scene anymore. Uh-uh. But I'm glad you had your five seconds of fame. <laughs> I'm glad we're famous. <laughs> yeah, so watch out. <laughs> Let's move on to the next segment, which is pull a card. I pulled a card. I'm going to read the quote and then ask Karen a question. Question. Okay, the quote is, it is the greatest of all mistakes to do nothing because you can only do a little. Sydney Smith. Yeah, wait, read it again. It is the greatest of all mistakes to do nothing because you can only do a little. Oh, yeah, I agree. I agree, too. Okay, let's ask the question, and then we'll go more into that. Okay. The question is, what am I avoiding because I believe a little is not enough? Okay, it's so funny how you and I are literally always on the same page. I feel like we could both speak to this right now. Mm -hmm. For me, so I... I told everybody to leave me alone this week because part of quitting corporate life, I was like, oh, it's nice because I want to be my own boss. But it's like I've had so much time and no structure that I almost don't get anything done. So I was like, I need to focus for just one week and get this Airbnb shit done. Like I have got to grow my Airbnb business and like actually start making money. I've been sitting on my ass for way too long now. Mm -hmm. And... I have this huge end goal of wanting to live off of passive income, which is a dream, and becoming a millionaire just so I can be financially stable and maybe consider having a family one day. But you have to start small. I'm not going to make that come true overnight. Mm -hmm. And so there were some places I found where I would only make like 10,000 per year off of that. So I started freaking out and I was like, fuck this. I'm just not going to do this at all. Like, how am I ever going to get to a million dollars a year off of $10,000? I'm going to have to manage like 500,000 different places. Mm -hmm. I ended up finding a different one. But to the point of this card, you've got to start little by little and take it step by step I can't just quit I'm not going to take one step and then get to my end result if that's not the way it works no not at all yeah and we, you're right we are going through the same thing of me trying to ber- build my personal training business and I got frustrated this week too because I was like I'm just I'm starting at the beginning and I feel like I have such a long way to go where I'm making the money that I want to make and it's just frustrating not to get there but I feel like just doing the little steps is such a challenge. Yes. You know, because you're so overwhelmed and you don't know. Yes. If it's gonna, you don't know how, you don't know if it's going to pay off. And yes. And it's just really hard. And actually, I've read the 
perfect book about this. This is a very popular book. I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard it, but Atomic Habits, you read it. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that it talks about exactly this. Um, the little catchphrase for the book is tiny changes, remarkable results. So you have to like start with those tiny little changes and this doesn't have to go towards building a business. Like we're talking. It's also just Anything. building, yeah, building better habits and breaking bad ones. You just have to start really, really small. Yeah. And then before you know it, you'll get it. That habit will be broken. The habit that you thought was so impossible to break. Yeah. You're going to look back one day and you're going to be like, oh shit, yeah, I broke yeah. that. Yeah. I was so shook when I read that in that book. Because no yeah. one had ever told me that. It's actually so simple. So and no simple. One, that's why this book is so popular and so famous is because it makes it so easy. We definitely recommend it if anyone's struggling with this. It's just a great place to start and it gives you actual action items that you can implement into your own life and just yeah it just makes it super easy yeah yeah i formed a lot of good habits and broke a lot of bad ones just last year alone just from reading that book wow i want yeah. to reread it you need to yeah and it's simple stuff i think one is you don't like staying up too late watching tv well move the tv out of your room <laughs> stuff like that yeah. all right so the affirmation for today is what i can do is enough Cute. I love that. I feel like we both needed to hear that. Okay, so our theme today is... It's the wildest theme ever. Yeah, and it's not the most pleasant, so... I was shocked. Yeah, we are going to put a trigger warning. It is disturbing, the stuff that we'll be talking about. Especially if you're a victim of assault, abuse, or rape. Specifically, we're talking about the effects of childhood sexual assault, but we are taking a stab at true crime in this episode, which we've never done before and I'm excited about. Yes. So we have two cases that we wanted to talk about. And I've, I'm obsessed with true crime. I've always loved it. I'm always listening to podcasts and watching YouTube videos about it. And I've known about both of these cases before, but I re-watched the videos about them recently. They're and, insane. Yeah. Insane. And it also just it made me feel really sad too. I and know. It felt, I just felt like this is something I want to talk about and just yeah. bring awareness to. So yeah, we're going to go over these two cases. The first one is about Beth Thomas. She was born in 1985 and she was the survivor of really bad childhood sexual abuse and yeah what happened to her after the abuse is just insane. mind blowing yeah so if you guys are not familiar with beth thomas there is a documentary i think it was made in the 90s 1992 is when it was made and it's called child of rage it was on hbo it's it's pretty popular we'll include it in the show notes yes we'll include in the show notes it's it's only about 30 minutes long it's an easy watch and it goes deeply into the effects of childhood sexual abuse and how you can actually be reformed from it which I thought was super interesting to see someone who went through that much abuse and was on such a dark path to be able to totally turn around. Yeah, this is why I love psychology. It's so fascinating learning like how someone turns into a crazy person and then how you can change that. Yeah, I reform that. Beth Thomas, she was 19 months old when she was adopted. Her birth mom died when she was one years old, and she was just left with her dad. Her and her brother, John, were adopted by a couple, uh, Tim and Julie. Tim was a pastor, and Julie was a stay-at-home mom. They couldn't have kids, and they got a call that there were two kids that became available to adopt. They were so excited, took them in, but quickly realized there was something wrong. Beth and John both started to show some signs of previous trauma and the adoptive parents weren't aware Which of... Which is crazy because she was only one year old, right? Yeah, when they 19 had months, her. so like a year and a half. That's crazy. Yeah. So yeah, pretty quickly they started showing some signs and they were told that the kids were perfectly healthy, but Beth was abusive to her brother both physically and sexually at one year yeah old, so like, i don't know when what? yeah i'm, I'm i don't know half, exactly whatever. how old she was when the abuse started towards her brother um because she was 19 months when they adopted her jonathan was seven mm -hmm. months but yeah pretty soon when she was able to like 
talk and oh and walk move around. And all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She would start abusing her brother. That's and crazy. it was yeah, it was really bad stuff. So apparently she would stake pins in him. She would pinch and pull his private parts. Her parents caught her molesting her brother several times. And he would cry and yell at her to stop. Yeah, but she wouldn't And she stop. would feel nothing. Yeah. yeah. she just wouldn't. She'd keep she, going. Yeah. So, obviously, something was wrong. Um, also, when they adopted John, he couldn't move his head or look upright. He just had development problems. So, they found out that there was more to the story about their past. That's when Beth and John were taken into the adoptive agency. They were living in really bad conditions. Beth and John hardly had any food throughout the day. I think they said they got like a cereal, like, you know, those little tiny cereals. The little boxes. The little boxes of cereals is all they would have to eat. Oh, and that's when they so found, sad. I know. And when they found John, he was seven months old. He was found in a crib that was, you had dirty diapers in there. He had peed all over himself. There was spoiled milk in the bottle with his in his crib with him. And he had been laying down on his back for so long that the back of his head was flat. Oh my God, stop. That is Because he had no painful. stimulation. And that's why he couldn't move oh. his head or anything. Because he was just laying there. How do you do that there. to somebody? I don't know. That's crazy. Yeah, it's terrible. And... They also found out that Beth and John's father had been taken into police custody because he had been sexually abusing Beth, which, as we know, this explains Beth's behavior now as a child, molesting and abusing her brother. It's what's been done to her. So, yeah, they find this out, but things, they, they don't really know what to do. Tim and Julie, they, things just seem to be getting worse. Like, the abuse seems to get worse as Beth gets older, not only would Beth abuse her brother, but she would also abuse animals. So they had four animals, dogs and cats. She would stick pins in their animals as well. One time she found a nest of baby birds in one of the trees outside of their house. And her mom told her to be careful with the birds because they're fragile and you could hurt them. And the next morning she found the birds the baby birds dead on the patio and she asked beth what had happened uh, i don't think beth ever fessed up to it at that time but she would let, later admit that she did kill the birds on purpose oh and one time her mom couldn't find these kitchen knives anywhere and beth just pretended to not know anything about them and then randomly beth was like hey mom what did those knives look like that were missing? And her mom was like, what knives? And then Beth just had this smile on her face, but it was like a creepy smile. Yeah. And she had them in her room because she wanted to kill both her parents and her brother. And they start, started having to lock her door at night. Yeah. That way she wouldn't be able to like get out and literally murder them in mm -hmm. their sleep. Yeah. Yeah. They, they described it as just a miserable living situation. Things were getting yeah. worse and worse. She was really abusive to her brother one time her mom found her bashing john's head into the cement in the basement oh yeah like trying to kill him like she wasn't going to stop she only stopped because she got caught eventually things escalated so far that they started seeing a doctor the doctor's name is ken Majid. He's a clinical psychologist treating severely traumatized children. And the interview that he did with Beth is on the documentary. And it's really sad, but also mostly creepy because he's asking of this question, these questions like, what do you do to your brother? What do you want to do to your parents? And she just has no emotion or no, she doesn't have any remorse for anything she's done. He asked her, what do you want to do to your parents? She says she wants to kill them. He said, how would you do it? He said, I would stab them. He, said, he asked her, how would you stab them? She said, with a knife. And he said, when would you do it? And she said, in the middle of the night. And he asked her why she would do that in the middle of the night. And she said, so they wouldn't be able to see her do it. And this is, she was six years old. Yeah, six years old when this was interview, when this interview was happening. So on top of the abuse, Beth was also very sexual for a child of her age. 
apparently she was constantly masturbating. Yeah, she did it every day. Every day to the point where it got infected and it was bleeding and she had to go to the doctor. She would tell her parents she would have nightmares about being upstairs at her old home and a man coming up there and falling onto her and hurting her with his penis. So she was literally dreaming about what had happened with her dad. Ew. Yeah. Oh, like this God. poor girl. And that is painful for a child to be having so sex. Painful. Ew. Yeah. You should not even be exposed to that at that oh. age. Okay, one thing that I thought was interesting is when the doctor asked her why she wanted to kill her brother and her parents, she said, because I was hurt so bad, I don't want to be around people. Which is just kind of crazy. Even her at that young age was able to comprehend why she was doing that. Yeah, and to be hurt so bad to the point that you can't even value now your adoptive parents who are giving you a second ch chance at life. Like, you're already so damaged. Right, That's yeah. That's crazy. She had no feeling or connection or love with them, even though they're, they were amazing parents. Yeah. She was just so hurt that she didn't care. She didn't want to be around anyone. And she had so much anger and rage because of what had happened to her oh. that this is what she was doing this is how it was manifesting to this her breaks my heart you know? another part of the interview which was really sad was the doctor was looking at a drawing that beth had made it was a drawing of her and her dad and he asked her what was going on in the picture and she said you can't see but his hand is touching my private parts and in the drawing it was just like his hand on her ill yeah and beth in the drawing was sad and was crying because yeah, this was just so traumatizing for her even though she had no really emotions at this point that was all that was pretty much the only emotion she had was like fear and i guess I, anger I, too but the weird thing is watching her in the interview I think she was so numb already at that point and had already disassociated so much. You couldn't see any fear or anger in the interview. She just already looked like a straight up sociopath at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Totally disconnected. No, no yeah. emotions, no conscience or anything. And at one point in the interview, the doctor does ask Beth what her dad did to her. So not only did he salt her, he wouldn't feed her and he would also hit her. So he was just neglective, abusive, both physically and sexually. You know, she had no, and her, again, her mom died when she was one. So she had no parental love, no upbringing or anything. You know, it's crazy. Whenever Laura, I first started working with her and I just didn't understand where we were trying to get to the root of my trauma and why I was so miserable in life and adulthood and how she was like, it's because you didn't receive enough love in your childhood. I didn't understand it. But now, obviously, this is a way more severe case. Right. But this severe case is making me understand it because it, this makes sense, like, in this type of severity. Exactly. You know? Yeah. So, obviously, the doctor decided that Beth needed to be separated from her family. So, he sent her away to a reform school. I, I guess she was growing up on a farm. Okay, this was the crazier part. Yeah. As if it can't get any crazier. Right. So, Beth was sent to this home uh, the where they were going to treat her. The treatment started out as... They are being very strict with the kids who live there. They have to ask to go to the bathroom. Their doors are locked at night. They're always monitored. They are watched over 24-7. They can't do anything without asking for permission. And they pretty much just had chores all day. Like, yeah. they had to feed animals, wash clean. dishes, clean. Yeah, so they, they had complete control of the kids. They described it as the kids who do not trust anyone they don't want anyone to be their boss, so they have to teach them that they are not the boss, first of all. And because they can't be trusted because of the damage that they have done. These kids also believe that they are evil and that they are not a person of value. So they have very low self-esteem, obviously. So they have to change their mind to make the kids see themselves as valuable. 
So that's what they were doing with all of these chores. So they would praise the kids when they would do a chore well, you know, say good job, give them a treat, and little by little over time that would build up their self-esteem. So Beth made progress after just several, it said several months, it wasn't even like a year, Beth was already making progress. And you, wow. they show this on the documentary in the video. You can see her starting to be happy being around the animals. And you can see her hugging the doctor there. And she began to develop a sense of right or wrong. She began to respond to affection. And then eventually she started going to public school where she even made friends. She was part of the church and sang in the choir. And eventually she had the alarms removed from her door. The doctor who was running this facility even let her sleep in the same room as her own daughter. So eventually they just completely trusted her and no longer feared her. And this was all within the matter of uh, several months. That is so crazy. It's literally always the simplest things in life mm -hmm. that are the answer. I remember my mom mentioned one time, like, I was so sad in childhood where she gave us all chores. Sunday was our cleaning day, and I always had to clean the bathroom, mm -hmm. and I would cry, like, the first few times. Like, I was like, the worst what? Thing ever. Yeah, yeah, like, why are you punishing me? Why do I have to clean? And then when I got older, she said she did it to build our self-esteem. I never understood it, but now hearing it in this case, I'm like, holy shit, chores go a long way. Yeah, yeah. And it's just insane that you can take the most damaged, psychotic child yeah. and reform them in this way. It's wild. Just by, yeah, chores showing them love also. She didn't have any of that in her first, those first two years, I guess. She was a year and a half when she got adopted, but that's what kind of makes or breaks a child when it comes to these psychotic tendencies if they are in such a bad situation like that you know what that actually makes total sense because when she's first brought into this world that's when your brain doesn't know anything so you're just a sponge you're absorbing right. whatever you're exposed to so if all she was exposed to was mistreatment and toxic behavior that's obviously all she knows exactly so that, why would she act out of love? She doesn't know love. Yeah, exactly. Because they never develop a sense of love or consciousness or trust that you're supposed to be developing in those first one to two years. Yeah, I know Laura, our life coach, has said that every child who's born into this world, either her or my psychiatrist, somebody, one of my doctors has said, that a child needs food, shelter, and love. Those are like the mm -hmm. three crucial things for a healthy brain development. Yeah, but she had none of that. And see how Damn. she turned out. So the, the end of the documentary, there the doctor is interviewing her. And this actually broke my heart for some reason. It just made me really sad. But it was also a very happy moment too. But he is asking her about what she did to her brother and to animals. And she was able to admit that she did it because of the things her birth, birth father had done to her. Well, he asked her, who did she hurt the most? And she, at first she says her brother, and then she says herself. Which uh, is crazy for a kid to be able to process right. that and realize it. Yeah. So she said she hurt her brother the most and then she hurt herself the most. And then when he asked her how she feels about it, she starts crying and she says sad. Aww. Which is just, that really broke my heart. Like this poor little girl had to go through so much when your childhood years are supposed to be the most happiest of times. Ugh. Can you imagine healing and being able to feel emotion for the first time in your life? And then rather than being happy, realizing, oh, I've done all of this to my brother and parents. Yeah. That, yeah. Ugh. It must be heartbreaking. I know. Yeah. I, I, that one, that's what really hurt me the most when I watched that. I, I know. Just, yeah. I had just so much empathy for her. Like she already has to heal from all that trauma and then to heal of like what then she did to others. So it's like right. trauma on top of more trauma. Yeah. And the doctor, he ended it with saying she's made extreme progress, but her treatment is far from over. Like it's going to take years like and lifetime. years and years. Yeah. Things were not great for Beth. She was 
diagnosed with a disorder called reactive attachment disorder. This disorder is a condition where a child doesn't form healthy emotional bonds with their caretakers, often because of emotional neglect or abuse at an early age. So these children have trouble managing their emotions. And Beth actually has a happy ending. She is a professional nurse. She actually wrote a book about her experiences, and she is the founder of a initiative called Families by Design to help kids with reactive attachment disorder. Aww. Yeah. I want to go read her book. Yeah, I do too. And I believe she has kids too. So she has a family. Wow. She's a living until she stays out of the limelight. Like she didn't seem like she was someone who tried to make a lot of money mm. off of this situation. I mean, she did write a book, but yeah, there's but I'm not sure really it was to help others. Yeah. Not I didn't find attention. any, right. I didn't find like any interviews or anything like with her as an adult. But yeah, she wow. has a happy ending. So I'm just mind blown that you could turn something that severe around. Yeah, I was too. If you guys go watch this, you'll see how bad things were when they were doing the interview with Beth initially. This was someone who was going to grow up to be a serial killer. No doubt. Yeah. She was already showing homicidal tendencies at what? Two years old? Three years That's old? insane. Yeah. So Beth... I'm not going to say she's lucky, but she did get the luck of being able to get a second reformed. chance. Yeah. Yes, get a second chance. Because a lot of children in these situations, they don't have amazing parents like Beth did who are able to get her the treatment. Usually these children have terrible parents themselves who are never going to help their children. And that's what leads to serial killers. Yeah, and honestly, I'm glad that we found this severe story to talk about because I don't want to compare ourselves to Beth because her story is so severe, but I also just understand a lot of where she's coming from. I know in our own ways, you and I are also breaking generational trauma. This is a severe case that I think everybody can understand. This is what generational trauma is. Like, I'm sure her father was obviously abused in his childhood. Otherwise, he wouldn't be behaving this way. And then she was behaving this way. And then she started passing it on to her brother. And then if her brother ever had kids, if they didn't get the chance to mm -hmm. heal, like, this is called generational trauma is so somebody eventually has to do the work to heal in order for the generational trauma to break and for it to not continue to get passed down from generation to generation and this is long story short why I don't want to have my own children and why if I ever want to become a mom I will adopt mm -hmm. I know it's hard but I just feel so lucky to have gotten help and get a second chance to heal and break this cycle for my own family and so I just think it would mean a lot more to help somebody else do that yeah yeah I think you would, you would obviously be a great mother. So oh, thanks. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to move on to the second case, which is a very similar one, but Holy unfortunately God, it went even farther before anything was done. So this story is about Mary Bell. So that she was born in 1957 in Scottswood, which is in the United Kingdom. And unfortunately, she did not get help before her homicidal tendencies took over completely. She is Britain's youngest female killer. Damn. Yeah. So Mary was diagnosed with psychopathic personality disorder, which is a disorder marked by deficient emotional responses, lack of empathy, and poor behavioral controls, commonly resulting in persistent antisocial deviance and criminal behavior. Mary had a terrible childhood, just like Beth did. Her mom, her name was Elizabeth Betty Bell, was the source of this trauma. Shocker. There was nothing really known about Mary's dad. He wasn't in the picture. The he, dad was unknown. The mom yeah. got pregnant at 17, but since she was a sex worker, she didn't know who the father was. The, okay, that, so that's what it was. Yeah, she worked as a prostitute throughout Mary's entire childhood so she neglected mary a lot she would always leave her as a child even when mary was born the first thing that her mom said was take the thing away from me which is sad and not the womb like not the baby knew that was going on but that was the energy that was coming into God. mary's life so 
not only that, Betty would always try to get rid of Mary when she was a kid. And I'm not talking about just like get rid of her. She was trying to kill her. So there were multiple instances oh, where the mom was bipolar. Yes. The mom obviously had her own issues. Don't know her childhood history, but obviously it was not great. She was intentionally attempting to harm and kill her daughter. There was one occasion where Mary was found at the bottom of first floor window that she had been pushed out of. One time Mary had had to have gone to the hospital because she had overdosed on sleeping pills. <laughs> That was obviously her mom. And one time, Betty sold Mary to a mentally unstable woman who was unable to have her own children. So Betty just gave Mary away to this person. Once this woman's sister found out that someone had given her a child, she knew her sister was not mentally well, so she went to the police. The police made her give her child back to Betty. So, not only that, it gets worse. Betty was obviously a sex worker, and at some point during Mary's childhood, when she, she would four. was it when she turned four. <clears throat> Betty started letting her clients sexually abuse Mary for money. So now she has the sexual abuse on here. By this wasn't just one person; this was several. Who knows how many men? God damn. Yeah. So. Things were not looking great for Mary at all. She was almost 11 years old in 1968. She became friends with another troubled girl in the neighborhood. Her name was Norma. And these two were just troublemakers. There were two different instances where they were attacking and abusing other children. So this neighborhood that they lived in, it was one of those neighborhoods where the children are constantly out playing all the time. There's a bunch of abandoned buildings that they would play in, sand pits and stuff. So Mary was aggressive and violent towards her classmates. There was one instance where she tried to shove sand down another girl's throat. Wait, that's so funny. <laughs> it's just reminding me. That's so funny that this was normal back in the day. Because this was what, like the 1960s that yeah. kids were allowed to play in the street. My mom and dad's abuse was so toxic. We obviously don't know. He's never going to admit this to us. So we don't know who exactly called CPS on my mom. But this was like the first year that they had gotten divorced. So it was still like they were still going to uh, court and nothing was settled. And CPS showed up to school. They pulled me out of class. So I was excited. I was like, fuck yeah. Like, pull me out of class. Mm -hmm. What do you want to talk about? And I guess somebody had called and reported that they saw us, me, my brother and sister, playing in the middle of the street. So they were debating whether we needed to be taken away from my mom or not. Oh, wait, that's weird. <laughs> yeah. Because I played outside all the time as a kid. Well, I guess I don't remember exactly what happened, but they, they made it seem like, oh, I think it was like the middle of the nine. They were playing in the middle of the street. No one was watching them. Mm. But like... I think this was actually very normal in oh, the 1960s. Yeah. yeah, very normal. So Mary and Norma were always just tormenting the kids that were playing with them. There was one boy who was pushed from a seven-foot shelter. Like, they were on the roof of the shelter. They pushed him off. That very same evening, Mary and Norma tried to strangle three very young girls. I think they are like two or three years old who were playing in a sandbox. So... Things were just escalating from there. This was in 1968. So Mary's still 11. And this is when the first murder happened. It was a four-year-old boy. His name was Martin Brown. And he was found dead. He had been strangled to death in an, in an abandoned house. One of the houses that they played in. And as soon as... I think it was a worker who found them. As soon as the worker found them and was trying to resuscitate him, Mary and Norma showed up at the door. They had done this, and they just wanted to see what was going on. Shortly after that, there was a break-in to a nursery in the neighborhood, and there were notes left in there saying, I killed Martin. And there were, there was weird notes. I mean, Norma and um, Mary obviously wrote these letters, but they had left them there. They had trashed the, trashed the place. And then two days after Martin had been killed, Mary showed up at Martin's mom's doorstep and asked if she could see Martin. And her mom said, no, I'm sorry. He's 
dead. And she oh, said, this gives me chills. Yeah, she said, Oh, I know he's dead. I just wanted to see him in his coffin. Yeah. Oh. Super creepy. Like children of the corn. Yeah, what type the fuck? An 11 year old? What kind of an 11 year old wants to see that? Yeah, well, obviously she's crazy. And <laughs> obviously the mom slammed the door. So nine weeks later was the next murder. It was a three year old boy. His name was Brian Howe. And he was found strangled again. His murder was a little more gruesome. He was also found with pieces of his hair cut from his head. His genitals had been partially mutilated. And he had cuts on his legs. And there was also an attempt to carve an M in his stomach. Oh. Yeah. So apparently, at first, it was at first an N. And then someone finished carving in, to make it an M. Which oh. Norma and Mary, it's very obvious what's going on here. So... At Brian's funeral, Mary was actually there, and she was laughing. So the police are on to Mary already. They had heard from witnesses that Mary and Norma were playing with Brian in the street the night of his murder. So they take Mary and Norma in to interview them. Of course, they have conflicting stories about what they did that night, and... Mary actually accidentally gives herself away. She's trying to blame this on another boy. She's saying she saw another boy in the neighborhood that was beating Brian. And she said this boy had a pair of scissors and had tried to cut off a cat's tail with the scissors. Oh, but it was like the pair of scissors that was found in the yes. murder scene, right? Yeah, so these scissors that she's talking about is what she used to carve the M into Brian's stomach. Mary was telling the story to the police. She said, oh, but he couldn't get the scissors to work because they were broken. And the scissors that they were found at the scene were a broken pair of scissors. So now the officers are like, there. it's clear that Mary and Norma are involved. Yeah, like no one else but the cops and the killer would know right, about the would scissors. Right, would know that information. Yeah. The guy, they interviewed him and his parents. He wasn't even in town that day. Oh, yeah. He had an alibi. Right. So... Norma later ends up confessing and puts all the blame on Mary and says that she was there for both murders, but it was all Mary. So she led police to the crime scene and where a razor was hidden that they had used to cut up Martin as well. So this links them directly to the crime. Norma also drew a drawing of the Martin's dead body and had all the exact cuts that they had made on him. So they know Mary and Norma are to blame here and they charge them. I thought it was interesting the girls' responses when they were charged. So when they tell them that they're arresting them for murder, Mary just says, that's all right by me. Uh, Norma busted into tears and said, I never, I'll pay you back for this. Aww. So yeah, Mary and Norma were also, were obviously pretty different. Mary was obviously the leader of the pack and Norma was just kind of the follower. So this, when the trial started, they did psych evaluations on both of them and they found that Norma was intellectually delayed and she was a more submissive character who was like easily influenced and she was diagnosed sociopathic. And because of this, they actually let her off the hook. So they didn't charge her at all. They were putting all of it on Mary, even though both of the girls' fibers from their clothes were found on the body of Martin. Damn. But they still let Norma go because they are convinced that Mary, it was all Mary's idea. She had talked her into it, and she probably did most of the work, I'm guessing. Yeah. So they only convicted Mary. Mary was convicted of manslaughter. She wasn't convicted of murder. She was convicted of manslaughter. And Norma was acquitted of all charges. Upon hearing the jury's verdicts, Norma clapped her hands in excitement because she was obviously happy, whereas Mary bust into tears. She was very upset. So was her mom and grandmother. Uh, speaking of her mom, when she was on trial, she actually wrote a letter to her mom saying, please, you have to tell them that this is all your fault. Like, it's because of what you did to me that this happened. Please tell them or I'm going to go to jail forever. Which, again, it's crazy. Like, this little girl that she still knows why she's doing this and it was because of her mother yeah it's interesting that she knew that as a child because mm -hmm. a lot of times you think like these things are just so subconscious and you don't realize why you're doing yeah but both mary and beth had some awareness of like i guess maybe just their trauma was so severe and they knew kind of where that was 
Maybe because from. Mary must have been a little bit older, and I bet she was still getting raped. So she was conscious at that point to know that she was yeah, angry she, at her mom. Right. She eventually learned it. Whereas the previous girl, she was unconscious for all that, which explains right. why she just had no idea why she right. was doing any of that. Yeah. So Mary was sent away. She had she spent a total of twelve years oh, away. And when her when Mary begged her mom. Instead, what her mom did is she started making money off of it. Like, she submitted the letters to the press and started submitting pictures and, like, got it out in the newspaper. So, just try to become famous and make money off her daughter. So fucked up. What? Fuck Betty. <laughs> <laughs> like, she's definitely burning in hell now. Yeah. Um, good riddance, Betty. So oh, wait. We forgot to say one thing about the previous girl. How, when she healed... She said that she had done all of that because since she was never shown love, she thought that she wasn't a child of God. She thought she was a child of the devil. So right. poking her brother and like trying to kill, she just thought like that was her job here on earth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Crazy. That's insane. Yeah. Sorry, back to Mary. <laughs> okay, just finish up Mary's story. She, again, punishments back in the day were less severe than they are now. So she only spent 12 years away. The last four were in a prison, but the first eight years were in a reform kind of school. And it doesn't seem like she had a lot of treatment actually. Obviously this was the sixties, like therapy, psychology was still forming. Yeah. You know, we weren't very far along back then, but apparently she had a terrible experience at this reform school too. Like apparently she was raped there as well. Jeez. There's no information about Mary today at all because she got a court order that granted her anonymity. So she's completely anonymous. She has a new name. She does have a daughter and granddaughter, though. But what I did see in the documentary is... She was allowed to leave prison during it. She earned the rights. Like they would give them chores in prison mm -hmm. and they could start having like little jobs here and there. And then she actually behaved so good that they started letting her leave the jail to go do like a real job. And then mm -hmm. she would obviously go back to prison. So I think she also just from same as the previous girl, just from having chores, I think it helped her heal a little. She was still a little bit of a troublemaker. Like, she did so good with obviously like leaving jail and then coming back for work. But then I think on her 18th birthday, she sneaked out or didn't go back one night yeah. in order to like have sex with a guy. So she was still like scandalous and mischievous. Yeah, but I think that kind of helped her heal, literally just giving her discipline yeah, and yeah. telling her that she was wrong for what she did. Definitely. Yeah, she didn't have the, the amount of reform that Beth did, but there was, you know, the chores and that kind of reform, which obviously went a long way. She's, I'm assuming, not a serial killer anymore. I mean, who knows? <laughs> There's nothing out there about her, but she is living apparently a normal and I'm hoping healthy life. Yeah. Wait, would she still be alive? Oh, um, yeah. So she was born in 1957. So she is in her, she's old now. There's nothing in there. Well, again, if she passed away, I don't think anyone would know because oh, yeah. she's completely anonymous, but That's true. she would be in her six, late sixties now. Oh, okay. Yeah. So she's probably still alive. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I just am still shocked. I can't get over how important getting love is as a child and just how simple chores go and how long of a way they go and I know these are such severe cases so it's so easy for a lot of people to write this off but even think about it just like normal everyday parents who are so stressed out or who are fighting all the time with their husbands yes granted they're not like abusing and raping their kids mm -hmm. but it's still a lack of love in that household and I just hope that this is enough of a message to help them understand this impacts your kids severely oh yeah so, so if you're not in a healthy place your kids aren't going to be either no no and it's very sad like these stories are very sad to me obviously mm -hmm. mary's was a lot more severe than beth's this is what would have happened to beth if she did not get the treatment she did at yeah. that young of an age and if mary didn't get caught you know she would have gone on to kill more people so Damn. yeah this was very eye-opening obviously these are the most extreme of these cases 
but you can see how bad they are. If so, just think a little bit of abuse or a little bit of neglect, you know, that's going to, that's still going to be really bad for a child. Yeah. It's really impactful. Yeah. So we looked up some statistics about childhood sexual assault. So the real numbers are obviously hard to get because there's so many cases where people don't report their assault, but experts believe it's around eight to 20% for the abuse rate, which 20% is a lot. So in the U S it's estimated one in five girls are sexually abused as children and one in 20 boys are sexually abused as children. So Damn. that's a lot. Like one in five girls is a lot and kind of an alarming number. The most vulnerable children are aged seven to 13, which I thought was interesting because this is older than both Beth and Mary were when they got assaulted. So this really just goes to show, you know, the homicidal and like psychopathic tendencies are going to come from children who are raped at a much younger age, like one years old, two years old, like that, God. like Beth and Mary. Of course, children who are raped like between seven and 13, they're still going to have terrible trauma that they have to deal with. But I think they have already developed, like hopefully developed a sense of consciousness. Yeah. You know? This but, makes me think of even bullies at school. It's so sad because I'm not saying that all bullies are rape victims, but bullies are like they're not getting enough love at home and so then they go to school and they're mean to others oh, sure. because they don't have any love to give they're like being starved of that and they're the kids who need love the most but then because they're being mean to everybody then people are mean back to them so it's sad it's just an ongoing toxic cycle yeah 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 if you think about it, there's no way the bullies at your school were had like loving homes yeah. like perfect no. homes yeah there's definitely stuff going on there so, yeah, three out of four sexually abused children are abused by someone they know. It's usually a parent. I thought this was an interesting one. A child who has been abused as a child sexually is 13.7 times more likely to experience rape in their first year of college. I believe that. Yeah. Because I think once, well, two things happen. When you're a kid and you get raped, you're self-worth goes down because you know you always blame yourself as the kid like what did I do mm -hmm. to deserve this like did I give off the wrong impression especially because there's so many myths about rape like what you see in the movies like the little kids try to fight it off but what actually happens is so much in the brain goes on that your fight or flight responses don't actually kick in. You just freeze up and you don't know what to do. You just become paralyzed and you disassociate. So because of that, like kids don't know that it's even rape a lot of times. That's why they don't even like go crying to their parents like, I got raped. They kind of just go on about their lives and then just carry this shame with them like, I'm not worthy of, yeah. you know, having lost it to, like, a mature relationship where I was in love. Like, I just, I'm just not worthy of real love. Because, obviously, they know it's painful, but they're not able to put it all into words. So, when they're carrying all that shame with them, eventually, it's kind of a similar thing to, like, a bully who is so thirsty for love. Like, they don't have any love to give. Same with a rape victim. They end up behaving in promiscuous ways when they mm -hmm. grow up when like they're not under parental guidance anymore and they can just act out so think about in college when parents aren't around and they're drinking somebody with high self-worth would be able to stand up to a guy and say fuck off yeah. but somebody as a kid no kid has self-worth like no kid's gonna stand up to an adult who's abusing them they just take it so like mm -hmm. it's already happened once and you just continue on the cycle into college like they're just easier targets yeah yeah and they're also they have a hard time saying no they don't feel like they oh, can yeah. say no and also they're looking like a lot of times like we talked about in the last episode just looking for any sort of outlet to ease their pain. Yeah. So it's and a quick sex validation. Is an easy one they already know. Um, they're already, a lot of these people are already hypersexual. So yeah, this makes yeah. sense. And yeah. I think, you know, me and you, just from the trauma that we had, it wasn't 
like sexual, severely sexual like these, but we were both very promiscuous and yeah. just using that. So this yeah. totally makes sense. Totally. And our cases are so mild compared to these. And just to think of how severe, like all of the bad things that we went through in college. Like I can't even imagine these poor kids. I know. Yeah. Okay. So this makes me think of an experience that I went through, which I never, I'm telling you, I maybe have thought about it like four or five times since it's happened. And it happened when I was 16. It's just something I never think about. Cause I never really thought it was a big deal. Cause I've been so See sexual. to my point. Yeah. Like, I've been so sexual, sexual victims never think it's a big deal, but it's a ginormous deal. Yeah. And I guess the way I was justifying it is I've been so sexual since I was like 17, 16, 17 is when I started being sexual. I didn't have sex actually lose my virginity until 19. But like before that, I think I was either 16 or 17. I would meet, you know, random people and start having like sexual encounters and one of the first ones that I remember is with my best friend from, we were best friends like very young, second or third grade. And we stayed best friends up until I went to college. But I think, I'm pretty sure I was 16 because I remember this is when I first started telling my close friends that I was gay. And he was one of the people I told. And when I told him, we were just like in my room after school one day. And instead of it being like a normal conversation, the first thing he said was, let's hook up. What? I remember I was so uncomfortable. Like I did not. Yeah. That's so weird with a friend. Yeah. I did not want to hook up with him. I was not into it or interested at all. And I remember how uncomfortable I was. And I kept telling him like, no, I don't want to do that. I just remember feeling like he wouldn't drop it. Like he wouldn't let me move on in the conversation. We couldn't do anything else. He kept saying like, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Like it, it's not a big deal. It'll, it'll be fun. Blah, blah, blah. What? And I remember I finally just said, okay. And I just remember I was so uncomfortable during it. Like I was inside. I was just like, you know how it is. Yeah. yeah no, And this is literal sexual assault. Like this is what I mean about the myths. Like it's not always the guys like throwing somebody onto the bed and handcuffing them right. and forcing them. Like even little girls will be like, no, I don't want to. And then the guy will be like, well, don't you love me? Don't you want me to show you love? Like it's actually not as uh, physically abusive as the myths make it out to be. Like right. this is literal rape. Yeah. Yeah. So I just remember just being really grossed out, really uncomfortable. I remember Shortly after that, he had told me that another one of our friends had done that to him. So he... Oh my God. Yeah, but it was worse with him and his friend or him and our other friend. Like we, I mean, yes, he pressured me into it. I didn't want to do it at all. We didn't actually like penetrate. We just did other things, which is still assault. But apparently with him and his other friends, he would, he had convinced him to actually have sex with him. And they, this was something that like he made him do all the time. Oh yeah. my God. And this is, yeah. And then he did the same thing to me almost. See, yes. Oh my God. And this is what I mean about why it's so important to heal and break the cycles of trauma because like your friend was a victim of rape and now here he is subconsciously doing it to other people. And I'm sure he doesn't see himself as a rapist, but this right. is the problem. Yeah. And I remember when this happened with my friend and our other friend, they were a lot younger too, you know, like probably 13 or had just gone through puberty. So it was a very, they were very young. Hell when that happened. no. Yeah. Even 16, that's still a little yeah. child. Yeah. You're still a child. And it just kind of makes me think sometimes, like, does that play into how hypersexual I turned out to be? Absolutely. Yeah. Because then you turn into your friend where he started doing it to you and other people. Then you started doing the same thing until now that you're healed. Yeah. I mean, I was never, let's be clear, I'm well, not, I was never yeah, sorry, sorry. forcing it. Or, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no. But I did turn out to be, like, a very sexual person. That That's always kind of an experience that I don't think about. Or I don't factor into how I turned out. Cause yeah, because you I've never... Always, yeah, I've always been so sexual. I was like, oh, yeah, that was just like one of my first experiences. Me. But it was, yeah, it was not 
a pleasant experience. It wasn't one that I wanted. And this is the issue too with why rape cases don't ever get reported because people don't even realize that they are rape victims. Right. And they just take all the responsibility exactly as you've done. Like, yeah. oh, it's just me. It is what it is. But they don't realize like, no, what happened with you first was rape and then the aftermath after was your promiscuity. Mm-hmm. Which yeah, is all right. like an aftermath of your you being assaulted. Like it's not you. It's yeah. not your fault. Yeah. And I believe that. You know what's crazy is I never actually told that story out loud until literally last month of my birthday trip. And it's crazy that you just forget. Yeah. Because it I just has hardly defined your it. entire life after yeah. that moment. Insane. Yeah. It's just so crazy. This is why I find psychology so fascinating. Like how does your mind just, you know, not process this and take all responsibility when you're clearly the victim? Like, just how the mind works is wild. Yeah, it's crazy. Absolutely crazy. Okay, getting back to the statistics, we'll just finish this up. Some other interesting statistics that we found. So, the National Children's Alliance, they handle child abuse cases. So, 58% of their cases in 2022 were sexual assault of children. So over half. God damn. Yeah. So this is way more than neglect or physical abuse. That's so gross. Yeah, 58%. 247,543 cases just last year. The good news is the cases are dropping from, you know, the 60s and 70s. So from 1992 to 2000, it actually dropped 40%. And it's dropping more since then. This number could be, again, not accurate because there may there is theory that there may be less reporting now due to sexual assault backlash, which I guess wasn't as prevalent back then as it is now, the, the backlash mm -hmm. that came with it. Um, but there is theories that this could be due to decades of prevention treatment, aggressive criminal justice activity, just taking mental health more seriously. You know, these people are getting treatment and getting healed, so they're less likely to abuse others. So other symptoms of abused children besides, you know, the severe ones that we went over with Beth and Mary, but uh, the children are going to feel guilty, ashamed, confused, which is why they won't come forward. They'll be withdrawn. We'll have trouble making friends. They'll be possibly angry, depressed, anxious. And I know you're reading off the list, but I just want to take a moment to add like the severity of all these things that you're reading off. Like, oh, they'll be angry. No, no, no. Like angry to the point where some of these kids literally murder right. other people. Yeah, like, like extreme anger problems. Yeah. 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 Like sleep problems, nightmares. Um, they'll be rebellious children, always getting in trouble, missing, missing school, self-harm, and even suicide as well. And disassociation, too. It just sounds like, oh, whatever, they, they disassociate. But I was reading as we were prepping for this. And just for people to understand how severe disassociation is, like when you are just walking around numb all day long and you're not in tune, you just can't even feel any emotion anymore. And it's not even these severe cases. I went through that, too. And I'm still in the process of trying to get my emotions back, like, I don't even know how to explain it. It is, it's, I want to say it's the weirdest feeling, but it's also not because. It's like, you don't it, know. I anything. don't need, I don't know what I don't know. Right. So when my life coach was like, you don't like, what do you mean? You didn't feel any emotion when this happened. And I just was like, huh? I don't know. Like yeah. it just, it is what it is. But like, that's not normal. Like think about all the sociopaths just walking out there, like I know. tearing the world apart and yeah. they're all victims of abuse and trauma. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. One question I was really interested about is why do people sexually assault children? And you know, there's no good answer. There's no answer that's going to justify it, but some of the most common things they find in people who do assault children are they need to feel power or control that they don't feel or that they didn't feel in their relationships with other adults. So again, abused people are going to abuse people. Mm -hmm. Physical or mental illness, of course, stuff like severe depression, PTSD. So same thing, I guess if they're so depressed, they also need how we needed like that quick fix and the quick validation in college. Maybe adults like there's a kid in front of them that's yeah. an easy way for them to also get that quick fix. Yeah, they're, with their twisted mind, they think like, yeah. yeah, that's how they're going to 
Yeah, get that fixed. And I'm sure, like, just how in college we're like, oh, this is normal. This is partying. We're just having fun. I'm sure these people who are abusing kids don't stop to think, like, I'm being a rapist. I'm being an abuser. Like, I don't think their mind works that way. Yeah, some of, uh, some of them do have an awareness, but, I, yeah, most of them, it, it is. like They're they probably have... disassociated themselves right, from feelings. Right, yeah. Another big common thing is stress, which I thought was kind of odd, but people who are in stressful situations, like in a family crisis, such as like domestic violence, marital conflicts, even single parenting. Also, people who are experiencing financial stress, poverty, unemployment. I mean, that's interesting because like, how do you go from that to then a Right, there's obviously more to it. I think this is just, they find a lot of people who are sexually assaulting children have these. Oh, they these. also have that. Yes. Yeah. So it's just a factor into it. Um, so as isolation, you know, people who don't have any family or spend mm. time with people. Child and family who is disabled. Another one, substance abuse. That one's a pretty obvious one. A lot of those are themes that you'll see in people that do sexually abuse children. I think probably the biggest one is the childhood trauma. So they were abused and, you know, this is where it has led them. I just cannot harp on this enough. Like, I hope everybody grasps how childhood trauma is a real thing. And I just really, really hope I, like, cannot say this enough how it's so easy because we're bringing up such extreme cases. It's so easy for anybody listening to this to be like, oh, I don't have any childhood like, trauma. I can't I relate to that. Yeah, yeah. But I promise you every single person on this earth has some sort of trauma. And the thing with trauma victims is that you always find an excuse. Like mm -hmm. it's exactly like being a rape victim. Like you don't realize like you're like, Oh, other people have it worse than I do. Like you don't validate yourself for what you've gone through. And this is another problem of why even in not severe cases, but what I was saying about how just parents, they think it's okay to have kids and then they're just raising these kids in a stressful household with money problems and marriage mm -hmm. problems. Yeah. You're not raping your kids, but it impacts them so much. Like I cannot stress this enough. Yeah. And I think, you know, there are kids out there who had perfectly loving parents, but even those type of kids are going to have some sort of trauma. Of course, it'll sound like nothing to most people, like a pet dying, you know, or yeah. something very simple. Like you can still acknowledge. That yeah. Kind what of we mean by trauma. trauma, like I think trauma sounds like such a drastic, like dramatic right. word. Like it doesn't have to be. But no, it doesn't have to be trauma in childhood. So, the statistic is that every child has three defining moments in their lives and that's like their big three traumatic moments. And it really all it means is just when their world isn't all of a sudden as blissful as it seemed. Because, mm -hmm. you know, every kid, when they're born, they are very blissful. So once they start to experience life for what it is, once they realize say yeah their pet fish dies and then they experience heartbreak that's one of the moments where they realize oh this world isn't always going to be like butterflies and rainbows that could be a defining traumatic moment for that kid and mm -hmm. then that shapes their personality moving forward yeah so then yeah. they have to heal from that otherwise they're going to be walking around like crazy people mm -hmm. when they become adults yeah Speaking of trauma, I hope we didn't traumatize you with all of these stories. <laughs> um, but thanks for hanging. We'll talk to y'all next week. Bye. Bye, Delulus. Listen up, Delulu besties. If you want to learn all about manifesting and become a master at attracting anything you want in your life, check out my virtual manifesting masterclass, karen-rico.com slash shop, or click on the link in the show notes. And if you want to watch us podcast every week, check out our YouTube channel, Balancing the Bullshit, or click on the link in the show notes.